Welcome back to the Nurse News Channel. We're going to continue our discussion on pre and post op nursing care. So, this is Dr. Catherine Prado Lefkowitz. As always, please check out www.nursemuse.com as it's a cool tool for you to help write your care plans and it has a ton of resources for nursing students. So, we've already talked about <clears throat> pre op. Now, we're going to move into the post op. So, during the post op period, the whole goal is to keep the patient breathing and to keep the patient's heart pumping. So we need to reestablish the patient, patient's basic physiological balance. Of course, we need to monitor and manage their pain. And our goal is to prevent any complications that can arise because of the surgery. Nurses who work in post-op, they're awesome in their assessment skills. We need to perform careful assessment and we need to provide immediate intervention to assist the patient to return to optimal function as quickly and safely and comfortably as possible. So the goals of post-op, we need to maintain adequate body systems functioning. Of course, we wanna restore the body to homeostasis. We want to make sure the patient is not in pain and any discomfort is alleviated as quickly as possible. We don't want any pre, uh, post-operative complications. And of course, we want to promote great discharge planning and health teaching so that they don't have any issues when they go home. So if you want to uh, remember the mnemonic post-op, post-operative, here we go, because I love mnemonics. So P is preventing and relieving any complications. So as soon as we think there's a complication, of course, we're going to be continually assessing we're going to speak to the surgeon so we can identify anything as quickly as possible. Our goals in post-op, make sure they continue breathing and their heart keeps pumping. So we're gonna uh, maintain optimal respiratory function. Support, we need to help them psychologically, make sure that they don't have too much anxiety or fear or fear of the unknown. Tissue perfusion, remember our ABCs. We need to make sure that tissue perf perf perfusion is maintained and that we keep their cardiovascular status um, maintained. Again, we wanna keep them breathing, keep their heart pumping, keep them out of pain. Of course, we're going to be observing and maintaining adequate fluid intake, whatever they are allowed to take and how much they can take at that time. We want to promote adequate nutrition and elimination. Um, if the patient is allowed to have protein, we need to make sure that the patient is eating protein when he is recovering, because uh, this helps in tissue repair. Adequate fluid and electrolyte balance. We need to monitor these and make sure our patients are stable here. Renal function. Again, this goes to making sure our heart is pumping effectively, all of the organs are getting enough oxygen, and that they're functioning properly. Of course, we wanna encourage ambulation, activity, mobility, um, as quickly and as safely as possible. Wound care, we wanna do thorough wound care and promote for adequate wound healing. Infection control is a big one. Of course, we wanna worry about their anxiety. If it's related to pain, how can we relieve it? How can we help the patient understand what's going on so that we can alleviate some of that pain? And then of course, eliminating environmental hazards and promoting client safety. So that's a good mnemonic for you. Just operative. So the PACU assessment. Our goal in PACU is to assess air exchange and the pa note the patient's skin color. So ABCs, we wanna make sure they're breathing well, their heart is pumping well, we're getting oxygen to the whole entire body, even their extremities. So we're gonna be assessing the extremities and their skin color. Of course, we want to understand what type of procedure the patient is coming out of and the name of the surgeon in case there are any issues or concerns we might have. We need to assess their neurological status, uh, their level of consciousness. Our goal is to bring them to the same neurological status that they went into the surgery with. So it's important to have a baseline neuro status before, and then of course, as they're coming out of anesthesia, once the anesthesia has warmed, uh, waned off, are they still where they were before they went into surgery? Of course, the cardiovascular assessment. We need to be lucky, looking at vital signs, um, and skin temperature. And then the operative site, we wanna be monitoring that for any uh, hemorrhaging or any concerns that we notice and we need to the surgeon right away. 
So post-op positioning. So just understand that moving a patient from one position to another uh, may result in uh, hypotension. So we need to be very cognizant of this, that we uh, move our patients safely, we keep them properly aligned, uh, we move them slowly, so we don't cause any further uh, injury uh, to the patient. We need to secure uh, restraints for IV fluids and blood transfusions. So make sure that those are securely in the patient so that they don't fall out or can't be pulled out. If the patient needs to be changed to a new position, we assist the patient. Uh, that is appropriate for the uh, surgery that he or she just came out of um, and make sure that we really uh, make sure that that incision site isn't um, hindered or contaminated or touched in unnecessary ways. Fall precautions are huge. We want to make sure that the side rails are up and that, um, like we said, all the IV lines are securely in. And we want to eliminate any possible sources of injuries or accidents when we're moving the patient from the OR to the recovery room or the PACU. So post-op airway. Airway is huge. So we need to keep the airway in place until the patient is fully awake and tries to get it out. Uh, we keep the airway in, loud, uh, in place, um, especially with the unconscious patient, because uh, we don't want the tongue to fall back and then occlude that airway. We need to make sure that we have a pharyngeal reflex. So when the patient regains consciousness, it may uh, be important to assess that gag reflex because we don't want to uh, take out an airway when the patient cannot sustain it on his or her own. Of course, if they have any secretions, we need to section these uh, as quickly as possible so that we don't have any aspiration. So post-op breathing, A, B, C's, airway breathing circulation. Of course, of course we want to assess their bilateral lung. Uh, make sure we need to auscultate them, make sure that they're clear. If they're not clear, identify what, si what sound you're hearing and just monitor those. Uh, we want to rest and place the patient in a lateral position with the neck not extended or hyperextended. Um, again, keeping uh, good body alignment for our patient that facilitates breathing and ventilation. We want to encourage the patient to take deep breaths. Uh, this aerates the lungs fully, and we, of course, we're trying to prevent pneumonia. We need to assess the patient's orientation to his or her name and commands. Um, cerebral function alteration is suggestive of impaired oxygen delivery. Of course, we know we want to turn the patient every one to two hours. Um, this is to decrease the risk of pressure injuries, but also to facilitate breathing and ventilation. And then when we do give the patients extra oxy oxygen, know that we humidify the oxygen um, so that we don't uh, irritate those nasal passages or the respiratory passages. And um, so we want to have humidified oxygen available. So ABCs, ABCs, post-op circulation. We need to be assessing the patient's vital signs and we need to report any abnormalities ASAP. Of course, we wanna make sure that the kidneys are waking up and the gut is waking up um, and we're able to swallow and we know who we are, we know where we are, we know what just happened. So we need to monitor I's and O's very closely. We need to be assessing that skin temperature looking at the uh, urine output, anything less than 30 cc's an hour is not good. Uh, the slow capillary refill, of course, we want capillary refill within three seconds. We're gonna assess any dropping in blood pressure, any narrowing of the pulse pressure or high pulse rate. So these are things that might indicate, you know, put up a little red flag that the patient might be going into shock or hemorrhage shock. Post-op temperature, again, making sure that we have great circulation and perfusion. So we need to do hourly temperature assessments to detect hypo or hyperthermia for our patients. Of course, we're gonna report any temperature abnormalities to the provider ASAP. And just know that uh, patients do have post-anesthesia shivering. Uh, it's called PAS. Um, it's a common side effect, but it shouldn't be occurring uh, for a prolonged time. So if the patient um, is hypothermic, you're gonna take their temperature. We can always use a heating blanket uh, to help regain 
their thermal balance. And of course, we want to put the patient in a therapeutic environment with proper temperature. So we do have warming blankets that we can give to the patient um, who's cold or is shivering because they just came out, came out of anesthesia, which is a normal finding for a limited amount of time. Of course, fluid volume. So again, we're assessing the patient's skin color, their turgor, their mental status, and body temperature. We need to be alert and monitor and recognize uh, evidence of fluid and electrolyte imbalances, such as nausea and vomiting and any body weakness. We're gonna be monitoring those I's and O's very closely. Uh, hypovolemia, of course, would be uh, represented with a decreased blood pressure, decreased urine output, an increased pulse rate, uh, increased respiratory rate, and a decreased uh, central venous pressure. And hypervolemia, of course, we're gonna see an increased blood pressure, changes in lung sound, such as the presence of crackles in uh, the base of one or two lungs, and maybe some changes in heart sounds, such as the presence of an S3 gallop. We talked about this a little bit, but we really need to pay, make sure that the patient is in proper body alignment. So we want to avoid any nerve damage or any muscle strains by properly supporting and padding uh, pressure areas. We need to assess our dressing uh, for possible constriction um, of the blood flow to any of the extremities. We want to raise the bed rails to prevent our patient from falling out. This is a safety concern. Protect the extremities where the IV fluid fluids are running into so that we don't accidentally pull out IV tubes. And of course, make sure that the bed is locked. So post GI, uh, if the patient comes back with an NG tube, of course, we need to monitor the patency and drainage. We need to give them some symptom medications, such as if they're experiencing nausea or vomiting, we need to give them medication to prevent this. Sometimes patients come out of anesthesia with hiccups. So if our patient is suffering from this, we can call the provider and get an order for a medication. Of course, we wanna help our patients return to their normal diet intake, but we wanna start out slow. So we usually have liquids first, and then we introduce soft foods, um, and then we can move on to solid food. But with every meal, make sure that the patient is tolerating it, they're not complaining of nausea or vomiting, and that they're able to keep it down. Uh, we can have paralytic ileuses and intestinal obstructions from anesthesia. So we need to really uh, maintain uh, assessment on that. We're listening to bowel sounds, we're feeding them, we're making sure that the patient is passing gas, that the patient has appropriate INOs. Presence of a drainage. So we need to connect the tubes to a specific tra uh, drainage system and we need to uh, assess the presence and condition of the dressings. So usually the surgeon will do the first dressing change, but you as a nurse need to be assessing um, the, the, the dressing, the wound dressing. Uh, you need to record the amount and type of wound dressing and drainage you're going to continuously be inspecting the, the dressings um, and reinforce them if necessary. You're not gonna change them the first time until the surgeon changes, changes it the first time, but you're gonna be looking in that dressing, making sure there's no excessive bleeding, making sure that the, the dressing isn't falling off. You're gonna provide proper wound care as needed. This is after the surgeon has already done the first dressing change. Of course, we don't wanna introduce any infection to our patients, so we need to perform our hand hygiene before and after working with the patient. We don't want our patients to have any pressure ulcers. So we need to be turning the patient side to side uh, every one to two hours. And again, keeping that patient in good body alignment and not straining any muscles um, or hindering any nerves. So sometimes um, it takes our body a while to wake up from anesthesia. So we need to be assessing all body systems when the patient comes back from surgery. We need to make sure our patient is voiding. So we're gonna be assessing for bladder distension and we're going to be watching that the patient voids within eight hours of surgery. If the patient says that he or she has to void but cannot void, then we need to be calling the provider. But we need to really make sure that the, the patient is able to void at least within eight hours of surgery. If the patient's having problems voiding, you can call the provider and get an order for a cath. Um, 
so to see you know how much urine is actually in the bladder of course you want to assess if the bladder is distended um, find out what's going on if the patient feels the urge to void or doesn't have any uh, urge at all we can try different methods to help the patients void such as letting the water run in the bathroom applying heat to the perineum anything to stimulate that urine to start flowing we can use a warm bedpan to reduce the discomfort and automatic tightness of muscles and the sphincter and of course we can assist patients who complain of not being able to use a bedpan uh, to use a commode or to sit or stand such as a male unless it's contraindicated and maybe their blood pressure is too low but anything you can do to get that patient to void of course our number one concern is safety so we need to make sure that the patient doesn't fall or doesn't faint due to loss of coordination due to any medications he's on or to that orthostatic hypotension when the patient does void you need to note the amount of urine voided we want to palpate the su suprapubic area for distension or tenderness and we can also use a portable ultrasound device to assess any residual volume left in the bladder after the patient, after the patient has avoided. Now, if you had to um, catheterize the patient because he couldn't avoid, then we're gonna continue this every four to six hours until the patient can avoid spontaneously. Um, and when the, when the residual is less than 100 cc's. So here's a post-op checklist I gave you guys. So again, ABCs, ABCs. We want to make sure that the patient is breathing and breathing easily on his own. We want to assess for clear lung sounds. Our vital signs need to be stable. Our body temperature is within normal limits with no chills or shivering. No signs of fluid volume imbalance, um, such as unequal intake and output. Pain, we need to really make sure that our patient is not in pain or has a tolerable amount of pain. We're going to um, inspect the wound edges after the surgeon has done the first dressing change. If we need to keep the side rails up for safety, we do that. Keep the patient in an appropriate position, especially if the surgery or um, type of procedure requires the person to stay in a, in a certain position after. And we wanna maintain a quiet and therapeutic environment so that the patient can rest. So here's a cute slide that I put in here you guys can look at um, just post-op complications that you really need to be aware of as the nurse either in PACU or even if you get a, a patient up from surgery. So when can the patient leave uh, the post-anesthesia care unit? They can leave when they have a cardiopulmonary status that is not compromised. We have stable vital signs. We have great output, at least 30 cc's an hour. The patient is alert and oriented to time, date, and place. They're able to follow commands. Uh, their pain is controlled. They don't have a ton of nausea or vomiting, and if they do, we have medications on board. We have good pulse oximeter readings, uh, usually above 95%, and that they're able to move all of their extremities um, and feel when you touch them.